All right. Hey, good morning, church. Good morning. Yeah, that was good. I didn't have to do it twice. Hey, uh, man, it is a blessing to be here with you this morning. Are you all ready to worship? You ready to worship the Lord? Hey, the first song we're going to do is called I Thank God. And I love this song because it talks about we were wandering in the night, uh, wanting a place to hide, and then God came along, saved us, gives us life, gives us light. And um, I need to turn my little thing on. I love worshiping this song with y'all. So y'all ready? Y'all ready to sing it out? All right, here we go. Let's get this thing going. Oh, I'm in the room. Get our clap going, church. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. I tried with all my might. But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting Vagabond Just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know And he told me that I was not alone Oh, oh, oh come on He picked me Shout this out. Come on. I thank God. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old Burden and bitterness, you can just keep moving. No, you ain't welcome here. From now till I walk the streets of gold, sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, and everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I as we continue in worship bring up a specific time when God has come through for you this morning let's not just sing words and try to sing notes put a memory to it let's praise God through what he's done for us in the good and the bad
Hey, turn to somebody you didn't come with. Make everybody feel welcome. Say hello. Good morning, Hope Church. I asked Jonathan if I could take a little liberty. I'm up here to do announcements, but uh, I couldn't help but feel in my spirit while we were singing that song that maybe there's some of you here this morning that the wind's blowing and the rain's coming down in your life and you're struggling right now, and it's even hard to sing that song because of what you're going through. So... I want to just take a minute, and um, I, I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if that's you, but you know who you are if you're here this morning. So can we just bow our heads and just pray for those who may really be going through that trial right now? And I just want to say that if that's you, just remember what we just sang. We're going to make it through with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Father, I just lift uh, lift everyone here. We're so thankful, Lord, for the moving of your spirit and uh, Lord, for your faithfulness. But Lord, I know that when we're going through trials, sometimes it's so heavy, Lord, it's hard to, to get beyond that and to really put our hearts uh, uh, in right perspective, Lord, and to recognize that with you all things are possible and we're going to get through this. Lord, you're going to see us through it. So I want to lift those up this morning that are struggling, uh, Lord, that are in a place where it's dark, where it's difficult, where, where they're trying to work things out, they're trying to figure things out. Lord, I just pray that you, first of all, give them a peace and a calm. And secondly, I pray, Lord, that they see your hand. Even today, this week, Lord, begin to move and meet needs and work things out, whatever it is, if it's a, a physical, financial need, Lord, or a relationship, whatever's going on, I just pray, God, for your divine intervention, your grace, to flow in the midst of all of it. And we just agree together. And everyone said, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Thank you for letting me take a little liberty to do that this morning. Uh, my name is Brandon. I'm up here to make announcements. <laughs> Actually, I think I'm like Brandon and a half over here, but anyway. <laughs> Are you glad you're in church this morning? Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. I just want to few quick reminders. Uh, orientation class next Sunday. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out at the uh, information table. Uh, if you haven't been to orientation class, this is your chance. Next Sunday during uh, second service is when it starts, so uh, sign up out there uh, for orientation class. Also, uh, we will be leaving this Thursday to go to Acuna. Uh, we have a good group uh, that's going with us. We want to ask you to pray with us. Uh, we've got more guys and girls going this time. I'm excited uh, about that. Um, we've got a lot of work we need to do. So uh, if you're going, if you are on the team, the team's full, so we can't, take, can't add anybody right now. But uh, if you are going, we're meeting right after second service just to go through a few things. And we're leaving early Thursday morning, so keep us in your prayer. Hey, Jeff, are any of those guys here in the room with us? Uh, yeah, there's a few. If, if Those that here, are going to Acuna? You're about to be totally out of your comfort zone in Acuna. So if you're here and going, can you stand up with us? All right. Joel, I know you're going too, brother. Christy's going. All right. We got a group. Hey, can we just say a prayer sure. over this trip real quick? If, if you see one of these guys, can you kind of surround them? Maybe put your hand on them and, and let's lift it up. Eric, since we're going, would you lead us in a prayer just over this trip God um, we just bring these these people going on this trip before you God and we ask for um, you to be on them Lord as they go you know travel in mercies God we pray that you help them as they they go and then come back but God uh, just more importantly God that your spirit would be with them in Acuna and um, Lord we're not just just praying for everything to go great and all that lord we just pray for your spirit to move and for people's lives to be changed by who you are and what you're doing god um we see you moving in this church at hope church we see you changing lives and i i just pray god as they go 
uh, down to Acuna, God, that you would continue that, that you would continue to change lives for the name of Christ, that you'd bring people to the reality of who you are and what you've done. Um, so, God, we pray for them. We love them, and we can't wait to hear the stories of what you've done and the lives you've changed, Lord, when they come back. You are so good to us, Lord. We thank you, God, for being here with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're having a little staff meeting up here. If you okay. <laughs> Wait just a second. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to leave it alone. There is a new face that you're going to see around here. Two new faces you're going to see around here pretty regularly. We are really excited to have Joel and Lauren here this morning. Today is their first Sunday. And uh, Joel, we are, we're excited for you to be here. And uh, we have a little something for you just to uh, welcome you to Rockport. <coughs> All right. We have a new youth minister, Hope Church. Yeah. So excited about it. Yes. Now, we want you to go through it, but not until after the second service, because <laughs> it's never going to look this pretty again if, if you unpack it. But this is a, a basket full of uh, specifically Rockport things. Am I missing anything there, Chrissy? So, it's all Rockport stuff. Yes. Now, you are going to fall in love with this couple, just as I love them. I know that Lauren is my niece, so I, I have a little bit of, of an advantage here of going into this. Um, I just can't be more excited for this day and, and this uh, beginning of a new season um, for our church, but for Joel and Lauren as well. Now, Joel and Lauren, I to just remind you, you're going to be married on August 31st this summer. Um, so Joel... <laughs> Don't you just love him? So Joel is, is starting today, is his first day, and Lauren is finishing up um, teaching in Pflugerville, and will we'll be coming down this summer after her school year is over. Uh, so lots of things to pray, lots of transitions for them. I want to tell you, what they need uh, more than anything is for you to love them, for you to take them out to your favorite place to eat and buy their lunch and their dinner. <laughs> And uh, we also have on this information table right out here uh, just a little love offering box. If you want to bless them today and just let them know, welcome to Rockport um, and, and give some money to them or, or write a sweet note to them or whatever you want to do, we just want you to do that. Uh, we want to surround them and, and pray for them. So um, would you, uh, can, we, can we do this? Could you stand with us? And if you'd like to come down here around them. Just lift them up. Father, we recognize in seeing Joel and Lauren here today that you are good to us. Father, that we began praying even at the end of last summer as elders of, we feel like the Lord is leading Brandon and Becky to begin to plant this church. Father, how are you going to replace that and what are you going to do and what are you going to raise up and father this young man and this young woman are an answer to that prayer thank you lord thank you for your faithfulness lord we know that our teenagers are in a world of hurt in this town and in this city and father we see in this couple a beacon of hope for them lord and so we pray an anointing over him. Father, that when he speaks, Lord, that demons would flee. Father, that when he speaks, that hearts of teenagers would turn and repent and get their lives right. Father, that those who have been held in darkness would be released, Lord, and would be brought into the light by the power of Jesus Christ. Father, we just pray over all these transitions, Lord, as they're um, looking to move into a home Father, as they're preparing for their marriage, as they're preparing for this ministry, God, that you would be the Lord of all of it and work and move in miraculous ways in their life. Lord, help them to know how much we love them and care for them. May we do a good job as a church of surrounding them and helping them adjust to, to the coastal bend. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
so you just figured that we were done praying. But we didn't come here today just to um, talk about God and not be changed by it. You see, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, For the love of Christ controls us. What a statement. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Isn't that beautiful? So today we want to celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ through the Lord's Supper. This is a time, church, for you to repent of sin, for you to bow before the throne of God. Let him wash you clean by the blood of Jesus. This is a time for you to remember in that sacrifice of Jesus that we find forgiveness through his blood, that we find healing through his body that's been broken for us. This is a time, if you're here with friends or with family, for you to hold hands together to pray for one another and ask the Lord's favor upon each other. Let's use this time and take advantage of it because God is good to us. Because one died for all, that we could lay our lives down and live in the power of his resurrection. There's a table in, in each back corner. There are these two tables here at the front. If you are a Christian saved by the grace of God, then we invite you to partake of the Lord's Supper. We would ask you to come to a table and get the bread and the juice and return back to your seat. And when your heart is ready, we would ask for you to eat of the bread and to drink of the juice and remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We give this time to you, Lord, as an offering. Stir and move in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. When you're ready, please stand and let's partake together. Until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so.
under earth is great before moved by the sound of his voice seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken from my from me to not believe even when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea
Father God, the only reason why we can say it as well is because your presence is with us. God, and as things look crazy around us, God, you are our anchor. You're our rock. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. So again, Lord, in this room, Lord, as, as, as Jeff was saying earlier, everybody's going through different things in this room. And God, in those trials, in those hardships, God, we can only say it as well because you're with us. You're in us, God. Our hope is in eternity, God. Our hope is in you. Thank you, God, for meeting with us this morning. I just pray that as Jonathan brings your word, God, that we, your people, would listen. That we would take our bread, take your bread into our bodies, Lord, and learn from you. Thank you, God, for all you do. Thank you, God, for your presence in this place. Be glorified in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Boy, it's so good to be back here with y'all. I just want to give a shout out to Brandon, who is not here this morning, and tell him thank you for preaching for me last week. Uh, I know that uh, he had a wedding today and uh, hated to be gone on Joel's first Sunday, that's for sure, uh, but uh, look forward to him coming back soon today. Um, I promise that every time she shows up, because I'm sure that we're going to be seeing her a little bit more uh, these days, but I did want to introduce to you somebody who's here for the first time, I believe, right? Is this your first time? This is your second time. Okay, this is my sister, Sarah. Uh, sitting down here next to Lauren. So isn't she beautiful? Sarah, go on and stand up. There we go. You, you don't get very often to embarrass your older sister, and I did want to throw that in, that you were my older sister um, as we did that. Right? So Elizabeth and I were on a cruise last week, and um, I do appreciate your prayers for us. We had a fantastic time. A uh, cruise has a way of getting me out of my comfort zone, and you're probably going to hear a few stories about that as we go through this day. If you remember, a few weeks ago, we were in the book of 2 Corinthians, and we've been walking through this incredible letter to the Corinthian church, but two weeks ago, we were seeing in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians what happens specifically to Christians when we pass away from this world. And we saw just the glory of God as he's bringing Christians in to eternity and they're finding their home with the Lord. And Paul, his, his emphasis in that, if you remember, was that then we need to live our lives in light of that eternal dwelling with God. So we live by faith then in what is unseen in that time rather than by what we see in this world. And we know that that's a very difficult task. So we're picking up right in the middle of that, and Paul is still on this theme, still focused on that eternal realm and what is going on in us as we seek to live by faith. Paul's last statement that he made in verse 9 was that we seek to aim to please God. And what an incredible statement, right, our, that our aim, so we're not flailing around as Christians and what am I supposed to do that, no, we focus in and our aim is to please God. How do we do that? Some of you are saying, I don't know, I don't even know how to please my spouse, right? <laughs> how to please my boss. And I know we could say, well, let's be with him. Let's do things like we're doing here this morning to worship him in spirit and in truth, to partake of his body and his blood, to, to be his hands and feet. But, but how do we please him in what we do specifically? 
Because this here takes place a very short amount of time in the week. So are we only supposed to please him for this hour and ten minutes a week? Or what are we supposed to do when we go out from this gathering together? And it can't just be about some checklist, right? That, it, that it, it can't be about, oh, if I read my Bible 10 minutes a day and I pray 10 minutes and that's 20 minutes out of my day, God is certainly going to be pleased with that. That can't be what it's like because the Bible never even uh, begins to say things like that. It has to be about the heart of what we're doing, doesn't it? It has to be about how we are doing what we are doing. Because God has gifted everyone in this room in such drastically different ways that it's led us into different fields and the different jobs by God's glorious design of people so we can glorify God and be pleasing to God in each of the realms that God has called us to. So in these verses that we go through today, I I just want to pull out, if you will, three methods to focus your aim. To please the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Are you ready to jump into the deep end of the pool? Let me read it again. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Remember, Paul is still on this theme of what is taking place after we pass away as Christians in this world. And I see it in some of your eyes. You're saying, what, I've never heard anything like this before. What what is this talking about? Well, who is the we? Well, we must all appear. It's the same we that Paul has been using in all of these verses. This is us. This is Christians. We must appear before this judgment seat of Christ. Now, we know for sure this is not about heaven or hell. This isn't standing before Jesus and him saying, Wow, Jonathan, you stink. Go to hell. Because we know, because Paul has made it emphatically clear in in both the the letter to the first, first Corinthian letter and the second Corinthian letter that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. His blood is what has rescued us from hell, called us out of that pit, put our feet upon a firm rock that we can stand in Jesus. So this judgment isn't about heaven or hell. Some of you have heard this called the Bema seat of Christ, the Bema seat of Christ. And Paul gets this word from what Romans did. In fact, here's a picture that's been excavated. This isn't in Corinth, although... In Corinth, they have excavated the the Bema seat that they sat on. So this little area that's roped off, you see the stairs going up to it, and then that little round rock used to look more like a throne. And I forget where this picture came from, but very close to Corinth there as well. And a Roman tribunal, a Roman judge, would sit on this and settle a matter of an individual. And as he talked to that individual, he would be weighing the good and he would be weighing the bad and and the crowd would be gathered around to see what was going to be doled out and there would be good things talked about and bad things talked about and then the tribunal would, would settle a matter that was going on here. So you're saying, well, Jonathan, that doesn't help me. This is kind of scary. What is the judgment seat of Christ about? It's about accountability for you and for me. What do you do with the grace that God has given you? That's what this seat is about. So uh, I just thought it was a get out of hell free card. It is a get out of hell free card. You're done. You're out. Praise the Lord. You've been justified by Jesus Christ and declared not guilty. But what he's given you is more than just a card. What he's given you is the treasure of his presence in your life. A seal, Paul has called it already, that the Holy Spirit is upon you because of your faith in Jesus Christ. What are you doing with that treasure that God has given you? Are you wasting it in your life? 
Are you using it for the glory of God? At the Bema seat, there was good and bad for every individual in the knowing of all. And that's just as Paul describes it here with Jesus. This shouldn't be a surprise to us. Because throughout Scripture, the Lord refers to things like this. In fact, look in Matthew chapter 6, if you will, in, in verse 19. Jesus is telling us, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But what do we do? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. How important it is that we are laying up treasure in heaven. Look at what Paul told the Corinthians in his first letter. In chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, with silver, with precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. See, what Paul is talking about there, there's this foundation that has been laid through Jesus Christ. And in our work that we do as Christians, we build upon that foundation we build upon it with eternal things that God has given us operating in the Holy Spirit. But if we are trying to build things that are all about us, then those things will be destroyed. Those things don't last eternally. Only what God is doing in our lives and wants to do through us survives. So Elizabeth and I flew to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and we got to go to Jamaica and the two places in the Bahamas. We were supposed to go to Haiti, but the cruise line got scared about some of the craziness going on in Haiti. And we went to two places in the Bahamas. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to Nassau in the Bahamas, but we got to go snorkeling. And we're driving out in this little boat um, past Paradise Island. And why do they call it Paradise Island? Because you can see like 40 feet deep in the water. You can see the ground. It's, it's amazing. And we're passing by, and I'm asking Elizabeth, as we look at the homes that are going along Paradise Island, do you think that that is a hotel, or is that a house? It clearly has the makings of a house, but it's the size of a small hotel, right? It is. But I'm thinking that it's a house because parked in front of it is a yacht. Is that a yacht, or is that one of these little cruise ships? They go out. No, it's a yacht, but it has three stories. I know. That one has a pool in the front of the yacht. Why do they need a pool? They're in 40 feet of crystal clear water. I don't know, but it's important. It's three floors, and then it has a garage down below. We saw one of them open. That's where they had their jet skis and their motorboat in the garage of this thing. Th those people had spent more money on their yachts than I will ever see in my entire life of making money. I'm not exaggerating. The wealth was incredible. And I'm not here to, to talk bad about wealth because it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. It's not just money that's the root of all evil. But we know how to lay up for ourselves treasures on this earth. Some of us know better than others, right, how to do that. We understand that principle. So why do we miss out on what it means to lay up treasures in heaven? I want to give you a hint as to where that begins. It begins by loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and by loving your neighbor as yourself. Are those two things the heart of what you're doing? Are you working so that you can build an empire for yourself that's going to be burned up? It won't survive on that final day. Are you working so that the love of God can be seen through you with who you're interacting with? So that people can know, wow, this person has a spirit of God living within them. Those things will last. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, God says it this way. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, that's okay. He will receive a reward. Go back to that first one, how it began. I'm sorry, Avita. He says, therefore... Do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes. This is why. Because if the work that anyone has done, 
Am I right in saying that? Okay. He will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. That's what I was after right there. So God knows your heart. He knows it through and through. Right? He knows what the purposes are, so we can't say, oh, I'm going to read the Bible. It's taken me 20 minutes to read this thing, and I don't understand it, but at least I did it. Check. No, because he's looking at your heart. He's looking to make sure that you're building with these foundations of loving God and loving each other that will last through eternity. Here's what the judgment seat of Christ reminds me of. is that a life of faith doesn't free us from obeying Jesus Christ in this life. And some of us act like that. No, a a life of faith means that we follow Christ into a life that continues giving for eternity. You know, in the back of this cruise ship, there was an area where you could surf. And it's one of those, Schlitterbahn has one where this massive flow of water comes down and you put on this thing that's smaller than a surfboard, larger than a skateboard, and it doesn't have footholds, but you get into that and then you surf, supposedly, right? And I'm, I'm standing in the line for this surfing apparatus and, and I'm realizing that I'm the oldest one in line, which doesn't settle well in my heart anymore, but I'm in that line and I'm just praising God like, God, this is amazing. We're out here in the middle of the Caribbean. The sun is shining. I'm about to surf. This is incredible. And and I get up on this surfboard, and the lifeguard has helped me like a toddler, understanding, and they're looking like I'm fragile. And I'm on this surfboard, and I'm thinking, God, this is amazing. And instantly I'm thinking, I am amazing. (laughs) Right? I have to be the model of athletic perfection here. All of these middle schoolers and high schoolers that are in line are looking at me and saying, one day I will be like that. And (laughs) and I'm doing it. It's incredible. And and that took place in the matter of a few seconds. Isn't it amazing how we have that constant battle? Y'all are looking at me like I'm the only one that's ever had a thought like that. (laughs) All right. I know this might not look like the body of athletic perfection. (laughs) But isn't it amazing how one second we can be, Lord, this is for you, and the very next second, this is about me. And we battle, and Paul talks about that wrestling match between the flesh and the spirit that we battle against so often, your ability to lay down your ego and say, no, Lord, glory to you is going to be for this final day in the judgment seat of Christ. And God has a way, as a Christian, of bringing us back down to this area, right? Bringing us back down to earth. No sooner had I thought I am the model of athletic perfection and that water ripped that board out from underneath my feet. I landed on my back on that thing, and it was like Indiana Jones cracked my spine like a whip. And I wondered if I should try to get up. (laughs) And the... Lifeguard was saying, your second turn is ready. Come on back for your second try. You you get three tries. And I'm thinking, one was enough. (laughs) And I'm trying to figure out how to say this to save face. So like, no, I'm done. Here's the board. I'm going to go back to the kiddie pool after this. (laughs) But there is no way, right? Other than to say, Lord, thank you for that dose of humility. You're still good. And I still want to follow you. Can you see that in the context of your life? Lord, let my life not be about me. Let it be about you. Listen, church, when we want to aim to please God, we need to be motivated by the judgment seat of Christ. Look in verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we... But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. So, obviously, in this verse, God knows all. He knows Paul. He knows us. All of that is laid bare at the Bema seat anyway. 
Paul makes that conclusion. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. I hear a lot of Christians say, oh, the fear of the Lord is about reverence for the Lord. It is about that, how we have reverence. But you know something that I can't get around? The fear of the Lord is the fear of God. The word doesn't translate as reverence because there's other words that would translate that way. The word is fear. You say, well, we're not supposed to live in fear. The only fear we are supposed to have in our life is a fear of God. Any any other fear is supposed to be cast out of our life because the presence of God casts it out of our life. But when we look at God and we know that one day Jesus is going to be sitting on that beam of seat and I'm going to be standing before him and my life is going to be laid bare for you to see and for him to see and for all to know, that strikes a fear of God in me that is a good thing as a Christian. To say, Lord, I want to stand before you on that day in the faithfulness of your grace, praising you for everything that you've done in my life. Not in the shame of what I led my life to be. So he says, therefore, for the fear of God, that fear is healthy in us. Solomon says this in Proverbs chapter 9, in verse 10, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. We don't hide from the Lord, he knows, so we aim to please him because of his might and his power and his knowledge. He is God. When we aim to please him, here's a suggestion, to be wise by the fear of the Lord. Be wise by the fear of the Lord. Make your decisions before the Bema seat. Make your decisions looking at Christ on his throne. And then ask yourself, right, is this what would glorify God? Or not. Look in verse 12. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Again, what is he telling us here? It's the heart that matters. The pride of the world is about the outside, about the way that we look, about the way that the world sees us behaving. But the power of God is in your heart. Comes from your heart, into your mouth, into your hands, and into your feet. Paul says if we're acting abnormal, it's because of Christ within us. If we're acting sane, it's for you. What what does that mean? It means that Christ leads you to do things that the world doesn't understand. Have you been in that situation before? Have you forgiven that person that doesn't deserve it? See, that's abnormal in the world. Why would you do that? Because Christ has asked us to. But they don't deserve it. Neither did we deserve him to die on the cross. When you turn the other cheek for somebody that's just struck you, that's weird for this world. Why would we do it? Because Christ has asked us to. When we give our money to help those who are in need, that's weird for this world. Why? Because it costs enough to get the new Apple product. I'm not going to have any money left over at the end of that. Why would we do it? Because God asked us to do those things. And it's strange according to the world. When we lay down our life for our spouse, when we're right and we want to bow up to each other and we want to fight and we want to prove that we're right, but instead we choose to lay down our life for them, why would we do that? Because Christ asked us to do that. And it's weird for the world. Because the ways of God are different than the ways of this world. Paul is telling that to the Corinthians. It's not about how we look on the outside. It's how we look through the eyes of God and he's looking into your heart. What does he see as he's looking in there? I love these verses that we began with with the Lord's Supper. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, 
but for him, for who their sake died and was raised. The love of Christ controls us. And the Greek is ambiguous right here. That it, it, it could be that the love Christ has for us is controlling us, or it could be that the love we have for Christ is controlling us. And I love that ambiguity in the original language because it's really both, isn't it? It should be both. It's a relationship, not a one-way thing between God and us. Christ died for all. Do you know some of you are sitting here in this room thinking that Christ couldn't die for you? But he did. Right here, it's pretty clear. He died for you. He didn't die for you because you were good. He died for you because of the sin in your life. Now that's love, isn't it? He died for you, no exceptions. And by faith, we follow him. And he's telling us here, we follow him into his death. That's why we celebrate baptisms and rejoice so much in a church and, and got to celebrate on Resurrection Sunday as we baptize those in the, in the bay because you're buried with Christ in baptism. And that's what, what the step of faith is as we walk with Christ. Like, Jesus, I'm following you and I'm buried with you, no longer to live in my sin, but to be raised up in new life. That's why Paul says this in Galatians 2.20, that I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And he says, the life I live, I live now, uh, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's why Paul says in Romans 6, 4, we were buried therefore with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And this reality changes us, doesn't it? It changes the way we think when we look at this world. It changes the way we act when we act in this world. It changes our motivation because we will be with Christ forever. So we live by faith, not by sight. We make it our aim to please him. This is the third thing, to be effective by being controlled by the love of Christ. Be controlled by that love. Let that love be a motivation for you. Do you know uh, this cruise that we went on? I just give props to my wife here. My wife earned this cruise through the health coaching that she does. And there's something sweet about a vacation when it's paid for. <laughs> does that make sense? So... Um, if you were thinking you're paying your pastor too much, they're running off on these cruises, you're probably right, but it was a free cruise, okay? Um, I'm just joking. I, you're not right about that first thing. Um, it was interesting how the cruise infiltrated our life. We were so excited about it. At first, we were wondering, is this real? Did we, we really win it? Are there no, like little statements at the bottom saying, just kidding, didn't really win the cruise, you know. Should we start getting a tan, you know, do we have enough sunscreen? And then we're just getting excited about it. We're about, we're about to go on it, and then we're there, and we're just excited, and we're enjoying it. it. It infiltrated every aspect of our life, even work, right? It infiltrated work. Well, what are we going to do to prepare? I'm going to be gone for all these days, and I'm, I'm going to be cruising, and I'm not going to be thinking about you, and I'm not even going to have cell phone access. Praise the Lord, right? That um, while I'm gone there, so other people are going to have to, to talk. And it's amazing to me that if that can infiltrate every part of our life, how much more so can the love of God, where one died for all so that all could live for him, how much more so should that infiltrate every part of who we are? You know, I found that the cruise, I was telling you, made me uncomfortable in so many realms. They, they have like a, a theme dance nights on the main deck. It's 80s dance night. It's 70s dance night. I'm like, are there different moves for different decades? Because all I got is the rock back and forth, you know, and, that, and, the, and the ship helps you with that. And so if they did that in the 70s and 80s, then I can be out there. But other than that, I feel very uncomfortable on a dance floor, right? It is not my zone of where I need to be. 
I found that the love of Christ compels us to areas that are uncomfortable. Controlled by love. To lose sanity according to this world because we're following what he has for us. Oh, these truths are a continual renewal for us, Hope Church. Let's stay grounded in the truth of Christ. Father, thank you for this reminder today. Thank you for your love for us. God, we ask that as we think through these words and this text, that you would do your job, Holy Spirit, to just stir these words in us and remind us of the things we need to be reminded of. How we need your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So church, I just want to give you a few moments to think through these things, to respond to them. Maybe you want to stand with us and just proclaim these words. God, from the inside out, I want to be yours and know your ways and do your will. Maybe you want to pray for somebody right outside that door or pray with somebody. To the right is a prayer room. People would love to pray for you. Let's take this moment just to respond to the love of the Lord.
surrender, say in my heart and soul. here and a time to meet Joel and Lauren so come on around them give them a hug